Good evening. Welcome to Daniel chapter 3, our study for Wednesday night, adult Bible study. Hope you are enjoying our study of the book of Daniel as we look again uh, for the overview of Daniel. Chapter 1 was the personal history of Daniel as he at the age of 12 was carried captive to Babylon. Uh, part 2 of the book is chapters 2 through 7, the prophetic plan for the Gentiles. This was written in the Chaldean language. Part 3, chapters 8 through 12, is the prophetic plan for Israel, written in Hebrew. Uh, one of the main characters, Nebuchadnezzar II, who we'll be talking more about tonight. The conquest of Judah occurred over three invasions. The first invasion was under King Jehoiakim in 606 BC. This is when Daniel was carried away prisoner about age 12. The second invasion was under King Jehoiachin 598 BC. Jehoiachin and Ezekiel were carried away captive. And then the third and last invasion was under King Zedekiah in 586 BC. And this is when Jerusalem was totally destroyed. The remaining uh, children of Israel were carried captive to Babylon and Zedekiah was carried captive at this time. Daniel survived the 70 year Babylonian captivity. If you remember Jeremiah had pro, uh, prophesied that uh, the children of Israel would remain in captivity for 70 years and then return. Uh, Daniel lived throughout that entire 70 year Babylonian captivity. Uh, basically at the end of life he was probably too old to return back to Jerusalem with uh, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. So he remained in Babylon and died in Babylon. And he lived to be in his 80s. Uh, it was probably in his later life that he wrote the prophetic parts of his book. So we're looking tonight at Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 30. Uh, if you want to get your Bibles out and turn with us, uh, I always encourage you to follow along in your Bible. If we read something incorrectly uh, and you pick up on that, please send us a message. Uh, I'd love to see your comments uh, under these uh, studies as we go to uh, uh, reinforce that you understand what we are studying. And uh, if you have suggestions about the format or the way we are doing these studies, please, of course, let us know so that we can uh, meet your needs to the best of our ability. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, in verse 1, the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set that up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, and treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Now Nebuchadnezzar had smolten this image out of metal. Uh, he set it up in the plain. It was uh, very tall, very big, very large, and he commanded all people uh, as they came before this statue, when they heard the sound of music, they were to bow down and worship this statue. Now, if you remember in our lesson last week, Daniel had interpreted the dream for Nebuchadnezzar and uh, told Nebuchadnezzar he was the head of gold, so he takes uh, maybe a little uh, initiative on himself and decides to erect this statue that he's been dreaming about. Uh, makes it out of pure gold and sets it up and encourages all people to come and bow before it. Uh, maybe he took Daniel's words uh, to, to heart that God had placed him as a, a king above all nations and all people and uh, maybe that elevated his pride to such a level he thought he should be worshipped as a god. 
Uh, he had a lot of arrogance, a lot of pride. This is going to cause him some problems uh, a little bit further down the road. Uh, God blessed him and established him as a king. Uh, but uh, maybe Nebuchadnezzar is going to let this go to his head. So he's, a, he's erected a statue to himself. Now, uh, this is not uncommon. Um, a lot of kings erect statues, um, and some of the emperors of Rome erected statues of themselves and also commanded the people to bow down to these statues. So um, a lot of the gods were um, that the people worshipped, Baal himself may have been a uh, manifestation of Nimrod, the actual builder of the Tower of Babel. Uh, maybe he, uh, the stories of Nimrod, as they passed down from generation to generation, became the god Baal. Uh, so a lot of the gods started out possibly as humans uh, with uh, super uh, strength or power or ability or knowledge, and then they got elevated in folklore over time to the level of a god. Well, Nebuchadnezzar decides he's going to become a god himself, and he wants people to worship him. So he puts up this statue, and he commands that everybody in the kingdom uh, worship this statue. So here, therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet in verse 7, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So here's this huge image of a man, uh, possibly Nebuchadnezzar himself. Uh, he set up this image of gold and he commanded all people to bow down uh, to this image when they heard the sound of the music. Uh, wherefore at the time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sabbat, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image, which thou has set up. Now I want to stop there. Uh, tattletales. Okay. Um, here are these Chaldeans, uh, these learned people who are um, I'm sure still put out because Daniel, Daniel could interpret the king's dream and got elevated to the second highest in the kingdom and then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got appointed over to the affairs of Babylon. So here are these Jews uh, Jewish captives, no doubt, um, are telling Chaldeans who were born in Babylon how they're supposed to do things. Uh, these guys have great wisdom, they have great knowledge, great ability, and I'm sure they're doing a great job uh, doing what King Nebuchadnezzar wants them to do, and uh, they're, they're honoring God and serving the king and doing the things that they're supposed to do. Well, I'm sure some jealousy has uh, brewed up within this group of people, and they know the Jews go by the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments are very clear that we're not to bow down to any graven images, but we're to worship God and God alone. So the children of Israel, the Jews, uh, they were not going to worship this idol, uh, this statue of Nebuchadnezzar. There's no way they were going to bow down to this statue. They would bow down to God and God alone. If it bothers me today that so many uh, religious people think they need to bow down to statues and pray before statues and uh, light candles and do things of this nature. Um, we, we pray directly to God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit interprets our words to the Heavenly Father. We do not need a statue whether it's a statue of Mary, a statue of Jesus, a statue of uh, God, or we don't need a statue to relay a message to our Heavenly Father. Um, so we're not to bow down and worship any graven 
image. And this caused a split in the Catholic Church back in church history uh, because there were those in the Catholic Church that wanted to do away uh, with statue worship and there were those that wanted to keep it and the ones that wanted to keep it won. Uh, so uh, we as uh, uh, Free Will Baptists, we don't believe in worshiping statues or uh, emblems. You know, I don't, I don't think I should set up a cross at my house and bow down in front of that cross. Uh, I should pray from my heart directly to God uh, in spirit and in truth and God hears my prayers. I don't need a statue. I don't need uh, any graven images. I don't need a picture. Um, I don't need to light a candle. I don't need any of these things that are drifting back into culture that are from paganism. Uh, they're, they're not what God wanted. So here Nebuchadnezzar has erected this statue and commanded all people to bow before it. Uh, and if they don't bow, they're going to be cast in the fiery furnace. Well, of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not going to bow. They were going to bow to God and God alone. So here comes these Chaldeans, tattletales, uh, thinking, hey, we'll get these Jews in trouble, get rid of them, and then we can be uh, the most important people to the king again. Uh, so that's basically what's going on. They're telling on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, before the king, and they say, hey, these guys don't uh, serve your gods. They don't regard you as king. Uh, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. And see, that's really not true. I think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are actually more loyal to Nebuchadnezzar than these people that are telling on them. Uh, they were loyal to the king, but they weren't going to serve his gods. They weren't going to bow down to his image. Uh, they were going to serve the God of heaven, the God, the only God, uh, the, the living God. Uh, the real God, the God that can answer prayer and demonstrate his power through his servants here in this earth. And so uh, that had already been demonstrated to Nebuchadnezzar. He should have known this, but he allows this deception. And maybe he's just consumed with pride and arrogance. I don't know why he's so uh, full of himself at this particular point in time. Uh, so then Nebuchadnezzar, verse 13, the Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. So he gets fighting mad. He says, go get them and bring them before me. They go get them. They bring them before him. Uh, I'm sure at this point he's kind of worked up. He's real aggravated. He's real mad. He's not really had time to uh, let this kind of sink in and think about what he's doing. So he starts mouthing off. Uh, for what it's worth, he's the king. He's the most important person. He can make all the decisions he wants to make. He doesn't have to settle down. He doesn't have to cool off. He can do whatever he wants to. Uh, you give a person absolute power and they'll use that absolute power. Nebuchadnezzar had absolute power and he's using it here. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Now look at this statement that Nebuchadnezzar makes. Who is the God that can deliver you out of my hands? Now, does he not remember Daniel interpreting the dream for him? Uh, does he not remember what God's already done for the children of Israel, or for Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel? Um, and so here he's fighting mad. He, he tells them, uh, uh, you know, you don't serve my gods. You, you bow down to this or I'm going to cast you into the fiery furnace and I don't want to hear anything else out of you. It's kind of like, you know, it's my way or the highway. And that's exactly what he was was feeling and he was so consumed with himself that he said your God cannot deliver you out of my hands in other words I'm more powerful than your God uh, the judgment that I pose upon you is more than your God can save you from listen at the response of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, I first want you to look at this picture. This is a, uh, a potential furnace in the Babylonian era, uh, pro probably in that time. Now, these Babylonian furnaces were used as a brick killing or to smoke metal. Uh, uh, the, the brick they used, there, there was not a lot of building materials, and so they made brick, and they would heat that brick to about 1300 degrees Celsius, um, which is very hot. 
And so they would make these bricks and it would require that temperature to give the bricks the glaze. Um, and they would use these bricks then in their building projects. And so these kilns, they would uh, heat them very hot uh, uh, 1300 degrees Celsius, which is very hot, uh, in order to uh, to bake these bricks. And if they were using it for metal, they would also melt the metal. And so again, very hot. Uh, whichever way uh, these these uh, fiery furnaces could be uh, fired to any temperature uh, the the user wanted to, and they could make them completely uh, uh, just bold and red if they wanted to. Um, to, to burn or melt or uh, bake uh, anything they wanted to, to do. So uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have been very familiar with these furnaces. Uh, they would have been used industrially, so these guys would have seen them. They would have known exactly what it was. Uh, and basically a human body thrown into temperatures at that, high, at that height uh, that high of a temperature would would be consumed almost immediately. Um, it, it would be like cremation uh, when folks are cremated uh, uh, after they pass away. Uh, if they choose that, uh, these these furnaces would have disintegrated a body just almost immediately. Um, it, that's how hot it, these these furnaces would be. So in verse 16, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, knowing full well what they were facing, if they were to be cast into this furnace, uh, knew that they would die immediately, knew that the fire would consume them. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. In other words, we're, we're, we've thought about our response. We're not hastily uh, telling you this. We, we have really thought this through. Verse 17 says, If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. In other words, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in a respectful way, they said, Look, king, we realize your authority. We realize you have this power. Um, we realize that you are sovereign over us. But we're not going to serve your gods. We're not going to bow down to your statue. You may throw us in this fiery furnace. We know how hot these furnaces get. We know that if our God chooses, he can rescue us from this furnace. And we know, O king, that he can deliver us out of your hand. Um, Shadrach, and Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a, a complete faith in God. They knew God could deliver them. Um, and I, I would ask you today, do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your God can deliver you? Um, you know, we, we would then look at the martyrs, you know, the disciples that were killed for Christ and others uh, throughout the years ha that have been killed for their testimony and those that are being killed today in foreign countries like China and North Korea and the Middle East um, as we see Christians that are being killed uh, places in Africa uh, and other places, especially places where the Muslim faith is dominant uh, uh, as well as in China where uh, communism uh, is dominant in Russia. So here we see that, you know, God doesn't always deliver those that are to be executed for him. But here in this story, we see that he's able. Um, and for whatever reason, you know, uh, Nero took John the Baptist and would have boiled him in oil to kill uh, John, but it didn't kill John. So this scared Nero. He thought John was a god in and of himself, and so he exiled John to Isle of Patmos. Uh, and it's there that John saw his revelations and wrote the book of Revelation as well as his letters to the seven churches. So um, God used an attempted uh, uh, kill for John uh, to, to then allow John the ability to write the revelations and, and his books within the New Testament. So we don't know the mind of God, uh, whether God will deliver us or whether he won't. We don't know the answer uh, to that. Uh, but what we do know 
is that he's able. And that's the point that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego made. Uh, they had seen their family members slaughtered in Jerusalem. So they knew, uh, possibly, so they knew that uh, the Babylonians, that God had allowed them to kill many Jews. And they knew that God might allow Nebuchadnezzar to kill them in the fiery furnace. But so be it. Whether he can or whether he can't, it doesn't matter. They're not going to disobey God. They're not going to break away from what they know is true and what behavior they know they're supposed to exhibit. Uh, that's where we have to be today. No matter what comes, we've got to stand upon the solid rock and, and face it uh, to the best of our ability and ask for God's help. Um, I can't imagine being tortured. I can't imagine being burned. I can't imagine uh, facing uh, uh, my head being cut off or... Uh, a death sentence of some sort. I can't imagine being beaten or stoned or uh, burned. I, I just can't imagine um, that because I haven't been around that. I've not seen that as I've grown up. Um, I've heard stories and I've read stories and I've read the Bible and I know these things happen um, but I haven't experienced them personally and so I don't know how I would respond. Uh, in a similar circumstances. But I hope I would be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, knowing full well that God is able. Whether he does or whether he doesn't, that's up to him. But I should know he's able. Uh, then Nebuchadnezzar, full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He couldn't believe they were so boldly defiant uh, of his order and so trusting in their God. Uh, therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Uh, folks, I, I don't think you and I can even imagine what they actually did. Um, they overwhelmed this furnace uh, to heated it beyond its ability uh, to, to function. And so this furnace was seven times hotter than normal. And normal would have been sufficient to incinerate a human body. Uh, so they increased it seven times greater uh, than, than what it was wont to be heated. Verse 20, And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. So he got the strongest men he had. And, and in my mind, I'm thinking, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is saying, oh, your God's not going to save you from my hands. I'm going to heat this furnace seven times hotter than it's want to be heated, and I'm going to pick the biggest guys in my army. Uh, they're going to bind you, they're going to tie you, and they're going to throw you into this fiery furnace, and there is no God that's going to be able to save you. So he used his strongest, and he heated his fire to the hottest. Uh, and folks, those that come against us will do the same thing. Um, they will use every earthly uh, uh, thing they can uh, to the severity in which they can to make us miserable uh, and to punish us for serving God. Uh, there's a time coming that's going to happen, and we need to be aware of that. And people are evil enough. You know, I see these people that are losing their minds in Portland and uh, in these inner cities that are going crazy right now. And there are innocent bystanders that are being thrown into the ray uh, and, and hurt, and hurt bad uh, as a result of the actions of these people. They're just blind rage. Um, there's you know, no rhyme or reason for what they're doing. They're just out being destructive, uh, filled with anger and hatred and uh, despising every person they come in contact with, no matter who it is, no matter the color of their skin or what's going on. Uh, they just are attacking um, uh, anybody that gets in their way. Uh, and they're, they're hurting good people and people that are there uh, peaceful to, to protest uh, and, and they're hurting them. So uh, this, is, this is Nebuchadnezzar. He gets the biggest to strongest. He's going to use every resource he can to destroy these guys. In verse 21, then these men were bound in their coats, their hose and their hats, 
their out their other garments and were cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. They didn't take their clothes off. They wrapped everything they had around them, their hats, their coats, their clothes. Uh, they wanted to consume them entirely uh, and uh, throw them into the fire. So that's exactly what they did. Verse 22 says, Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In other words, the guys carried them up onto uh, the, the uh, furnace and they were going to toss them into the furnace. And as they were tossing these guys into the furnace, the three men that were tossing them were consumed by the flames. As you know, uh, if you've ever seen a, a building on fire, uh, at some point in time the fire can just lip out of the, of the building. Um, and I, I, I see that as they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire, the flames rushed out, and because it was so hot, uh, it, it removed all the oxygen from their lungs, and I would think it burnt them uh, internally uh, to the point that they could not catch their breath. Even if it didn't consume their bodies, it so burnt them on the inside of their lungs as they breathed in that fire uh, that they died. Uh, they could not catch their breath and and they died uh, possibly of asphyxation uh, I don't think it burned them uh, to the extent that uh, um, they uh, their bodies were consumed uh, to ash but I do think that uh, the fire uh, uh, lashed out uh, it, it burnt them on the insides as they breathed in uh, and it singed their lungs to the extent uh, that they died almost immediately uh, from the heat of the fire uh, as it as it totally consumed them. So uh, this is an amazing story. Those three men that threw them in, the strongest in Nebuchadnezzar's army, he lost his three strongest soldiers. Uh, and these three Hebrew children who were probably still around 15, 16, maybe even a little older at this particular point in time. We don't know exactly. So these young guys uh, are saved and his are, they're thrown into the fire and his strongest soldiers die immediately. Now, as Nebuchadnezzar gazes into this fire, and uh, uh, this picture is a copyright uh, 2006 by Ted Larson. I kind of borrowed it off of the internet. Um, These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. As they fall down uh, into the fire, verse 24, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire. They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So, wow, all of a sudden, instead of just three children in the fire, there's a man in there with them. Um, and I think if the guys were teenagers or in their 20s, um, what uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw was an older figure uh, in the fire with them, and he uh, saw this figure as the Son of God. Uh, we believe this to be Jesus himself uh, in his uh, uh, pre-incarnate body uh, as he came to be uh, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego there in the fire. And maybe he cooled the fire himself. I don't know what's going on in the fire. I don't know what he said to the three Hebrew children. It's not recorded in scripture. Uh, We have no idea. But the most important thing that we need to gather from this, at their most trying time in their life, uh, when they needed God the most, he was there with them. Uh, You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego may have never even seen Jesus. Uh, He may have not said a word to them. But what Nebuchadnezzar saw is that God's children were not alone. They had someone there with them. 
they had a confidant with them. Uh, what did uh, Stephen uh, say as he was being stoned? He said, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Uh, I see Jesus. So uh, as, as Stephen was being stoned, as his life was leaving him, and I'm sure as the stones were pelting his body and uh, uh, the pain that he had to be going through, he looked up and uh, the people around him described it as, as if a glow was about uh, Stephen as he was being stoned and he saw Jesus uh, standing at the right hand of the Father and I'm sure Jesus was saying Stephen come on home uh, as, as Jesus was standing to salute this martyr uh, for taking uh, uh, this ultimate sacrifice and allowing himself to be killed uh, by these Jews. So here uh, Nebuchadnezzar sees this other figure uh, in the fire with uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I think you and I need to gather from this story is no matter what we face in life, God will be with us. Uh, no matter what circumstance, no matter what situation, uh, no matter what trial or what suffering, God will be with us. If we will hold on to him and honor him, he will be with us. It's when we fail to honor him that he cannot be with us. Uh, so as long as we'll honor him and do the things that he uh, asks us to do, uh, he will He will be with us. Uh, then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. Uh, as we look at this next picture, uh, these young men just came walking out of the fire. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> that could just almost kind of put you on shouting ground. Uh, Dad, when he, this story is ever preached, he, he just almost loses himself. He gets so excited. Uh, and I almost just lose myself sitting here thinking about these men uh, here, this little cartoon. Uh, they're they're kind of funny looking guys, uh, but what it was like to see it from Nebuchadnezzar's point of view, these three boys uh, come walking out of the fire. They told him, "said Our God is able. <laughs> we don't know whether He will, but He's able. He can deliver us out of your hands. You've picked your strongest soldiers. You've heated this fire seven times hotter than normal. And guess what?" Uh, we're fine, and they come walking out of the fire. What do you think these other people that are standing around are thinking as they see that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego cannot be consumed by the fire? Verse 27, And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. I want you to look at the extent of this miracle. Not only were they not consumed by the fire, not only were their lungs saved when the others were destroyed, uh, not one single hair was singed on their bodies. Now you can just stand by a brush pile uh, if you've ever burned a brush pile and, and you can get the hairs on your arms singed or on your face uh, just standing close to a fire. Uh, these guys were in the fire, down in the coals. Uh, just uh, You've got to just imagine that they were in the fire. Um, and I'm thinking that it burnt the ropes off of them that were binding them because Nebuchadnezzar said, come on out of there, and they walked out. Now, they had been bound and tied and thrown in, so the ropes burned off of their arms and off of their legs without burning their clothes. Um, this is such an amazing miracle. Not a hair was singed uh, on their bodies. Their clothes were not burned in any way. Uh, even the bonds that they were bound by were, were gone, but they were not harmed. Um, and their clothes, when they walked out of the fire, you couldn't smell the fire on them. Now, if I go out in the yard and burn a brush pile uh, and I walk inside, you can immediately smell the smoke on me. Uh, if we barbecue or, or grill, uh, you can smell the grill on your clothes. Uh, if we have a little bonfire beside the house in our little fire pit, uh, when you come in, you smell like smoke. Even though you weren't in the fire, you were just around the fire, you still smell like smoke. These guys did not smell like smoke at all. It was almost as if there was a little bubble around each of them 
filled with oxygen and moist air that shielded them from the fire that they were in. And when they walked out, the little bubble just disappeared uh, from around them. That's an amazing miracle of God. Uh, and we need to know that and understand that. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So here basically he said uh, nobody ever better make fun of these guys again. Don't ever make fun of them or their God ever again. Uh, no peer pressure. Uh, he put a bubble around them uh, so that the Chaldeans and the others couldn't criticize them, couldn't speak against them, and couldn't criticize their God uh, because they had been delivered by their God from the fiery furnace. So Daniel, uh, Daniel's friends here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, have have demonstrated their loyalty to God. Uh, God has honored that loyalty, and the king has elevated them within the kingdom, uh, and has uh, realized and has uh, uh, come to their side. Uh, as a result of them standing on the Word of God and their knowledge of God and being what God would have them to be. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed the lesson tonight. Uh, we will pick back up uh, next week in chapter 4 of Daniel. Uh, if you want to read ahead uh, and look at chapter 4, we'll pick up there. Hope you have a good rest of the week.